Thank you. Yes. Great. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Sorry for the for the the internet troubles. We're back at it. Um, happy to introduce Dr. Janakiram from India and his talk on mucormycosis and COVID-19. As previously said, mucormycosis has been a huge and tremendously impacting India during the second wave. And today's talk will be focused on the surgical nuances from one of those master in this field. So Janaki, please, if you could share your screen, we will go through a deep dive in uh, mucormycosis and COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Priya. I'm uh, really thankful to you for this opportunity. I hope you are able to see my screen. Surgical management of mucormycosis in COVID-19. Can you see my screen, please? You have to, you have to share the screen again. While he's uh, <coughs> sharing the screen, uh, uh, some information in regards to mucormycosis, also, black, also known as black fungus, the impact of COVID-19 tremendously increased the cases of mucormycosis, a disease that was previously not very common, which is uh, mainly affecting diabetic pa patients and patients that is, are immunocompromised. So the surgical challenges of, uh, of a patient suffering from uh, mucormycosis and COVID-19 are very, very challenging. So that's why the surgical plan should be properly addressed. Thank you. Please proceed with the presentation. Can you see the presentation, please, Dr. Priya? Yes. Okay, so uh, we will straight deep dive into this topic, surgical management of mucormycosis in COVID-19. I am Dr. Narayan Janakram, and uh, we generally do skull-based surgery in our center. So this is our specialty. And I think mucormycosis um, is, uh, is a pure skull-based uh, surgeon's domain because most of the uh, cases affect the skull base, the central skull base. Well, uh, as you know, what is the uh, name which we have given to it? It's the unholy trinity. The reason is uh, number one, India is the second most affected population in the world next to China, having 77 million people with diabetes. So diabetes is the most important, uh, you know, the substrate because COVID-19, when it affects the uh, diabetic individuals, you know, steroid is a treatment of choice. When you give steroids for diabetics, it naturally increases the blood sugar and that forms a very good substrate for mucormycosis to uh, actually become a, a pathogen inside the body. So the prevalence of mucormycosis is 0.14 cases per thousand. Then imagine how many cases of mucormycosis we would have dealt with. It is 80 times more prevalent in uh, India than in other developed countries. Well, this is the flow chart I want to talk about. It's very, very important that uh, COVID-19, the second wave, especially the first wave, we saw very few number of cases, maybe around 40 cases or so. But the second wave, we saw more than uh, you know, 400 plus cases uh, in a matter of just one year, one year, 400 cases, imagine almost a case every day. And even now, uh, today also, we operate on a case of COVID, uh, mucor, induced by mucor. So uh, the thing is, uh, the diabetics uh, who are there in India, uh, when they develop this uh, Delta variant, then we give corticosteroids and they already have diabetes. So what happens? It leads to hyperglycemia. And this leads to maybe diabetic ketostosis in some individuals or which mucormycosis starts growing. So that is the first cascade. The second cascade would be the Delta virus variant causing hypoxia, decreased CD4, CD8, and T cells, and then a metabolic acidosis, 
which leads to an increase in GRP78 and uh, cottage, which is the second cascade on which mucomycosis develops. The third cascade would be the delta variant, again, causes increase in ferritin. As we know, we, we check ferritin levels for all cases and also the IL-6 and the cytokines. And that again forms a very good, very good strata for mucomycosis to develop. So this is uh, in short, the whole flow chart. The while induced immune dysfunction forms the primary cause. Uh, hyperglycemia, diabetic ketoacidosis, virus induced pancreatic cell damage, islet cell damage has been reported. And the role of ferritin and viral mimicry, hepcidin has a role and viral angioinvasion uh, and upregulation of the GRP78 and COT-H3. Well, uh, now the patients usually present with headache. We, we, we see patients with various kinds of presentations here, especially in our center, which is a tertiary care center. So already many patients are operated three times, four times, five times, but then they present with proptosis, some with uh, loosening of teeth, some with uh, uh, you know blackening of skin, uh, so many, 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 many presentations. I'm not going to deal with that because uh, we're going to show a lot of cases to you. And uh, basically, when the patient after an episode of COVID comes to us uh, with uh, any of the symptoms pertaining to uh, mucor disease, then we ask for a CECT of the paranasal sinuses plus orbit plus brain. And we also ask for an MRI. MRI is the investigation of choice, especially the T1 with contrast and the T2 still, that is uh, short tau inversion recovery, fat suppressed T2 and the diffusion weighted image. Uh, the CBCT and the MDCT of the maxilla are very, very, very important. And the 3D reconstruction of the face is done in all the cases we have operated. So this is, this is the basic protocol which we follow apart from the blood investigations, uh, we, we follow this. And of course, we take a nasal smear and then stain it KOH and then, you know, uh, we find uh, the pro problem of uh, mucor. Oh, sorry. Uh, now, going on to the, um, going on to the uh, disease, actually in our center, we have we are going to form a classification. Of course, the classification, the paper has been uh, uh, written and uh, we are going to do a little modifications on it. We are along with Dr. Puya are going to publish this uh, uh, landmark publication because uh, this classification is going to help most of us, you know, operate on this case. We are going to form protocols how to operate. So we classified it as an anterior disease and a posterior disease. So well, what do you say anterior to us? See, before the COVID era, uh, there was a classification for uh, mucor mycosis, which was actually uh, from the pterygopalan and fossa and infratemporal fossa. So we found several cases where the PTF and IDF were not involved at all. So then uh, we analyzed the whole series and we found that the maxillary sinus was involved in the maximum number of cases. So we've, uh, even the early cases. So we decided that we're going to have this disease starting from the osteomeral complex and the maxillary sinus, so OMC and the maxilla. And from there, it can go downwards towards the palate. This all comes under the anterior group of anterior spread of disease, something like the JNA. So, uh, and then it also goes just in front of the maxilla, the soft tissue, that's a pre-maxilla. And sometimes it can go along the... Um, Infraorbital nerve. Infraorbital nerve is affected in uh, several cases. In fact, the, the exact numbers we will be uh, giving you in the flow charts once we publish our classification. So the infraorbital nerve and sometimes the orbit. And then you have the cribriform plate being affected, uh, the septum in a lot of cases. And once you have that anterior spread, then we go for the posterior spread. Uh, the a posterior spread can be divided into actually two lines, which is a medial, paramedian, and lateral. Uh, of course, uh, uh, from the uh, from the maxilla, it can also go towards the pterygopalatine and fossa and fratemporal fossa. So the pterygoid wedge is what is called the watershed zone for us because that is going to form, uh, because we found that the revisions, the maximum number of revisions 
um, revision cases we found were because of the residual here. The, the, the surgeons usually leave behind disease in this area. And that is why we classified it as a posterior uh, spread where you have the tribal involvement and then you have uh, the, the PPF, IKF, um, and also you can, VDN nerve is involved in a lot of cases. The V2, the V3 is involved, the foramen ovale, the greater ring of sphenoid. You've seen cases getting involved right till the, um, uh, you know, the orbit still here. So that is, that is something very devastating. The Meckel's cave, the cavernous sinus, the superior orbital fissure, all these bones are involved by the disease. And it actually spreads laterally to involve the temporal fossa, the zygoma, the lateral orbital wall. And in revision cases, we found that the posterior involvement is more than the anterior involvement. There's more of bilateral involvement and greater wing of sphenoid and the clivus, the apex of the uh, petrous bone, the Meckel's cave, the V3, the foramen ovale was involved. The cribriform plate and the frontal bone was involved. The retroorbital um, uh, part of the um, frontal bone is also involved. We found a lot of intracranial abscesses in revision cases. Well, this is just a, a small picture to show you uh, the kind of scans we take. This is actually the uh, T1 with contrast and the T2 stir fat suppressed image. You can see that the hyperdense images are just represented, representing the uh, um, mucomycosis. This is just a um, uh, just an idea of how uh, we do all the MRI scans. But this, I think, is more important for us. Uh, the MDCT the, um, uh, and the cone beam CT. The cone beam CT is so important because it actually picks up the uh, eroded bones in the palate, uh, in the anterior maxilla, and various parts which can be easily picked up with a multidimensional um, computerized tomogram as well as a bone beam CD. Now, we also plan for reconstruction. Reconstruction is never done in the same sitting. We do it after three months. Uh, the reason is because uh, we don't want to reconstruct a defect when you have an active disease. So we give amphotericin uh, after uh, uh, treating it surgically. So surgical debridement forms the first part of the treatment followed by medical treatment with uh, either amphotericin, liposomal amphotericin or posiconazole. And then we actually uh, plan for reconstruction. Now pe people have started coming in for reconstruction in our series. So this is just to plan the uh, bilateral maxillectomy uh, reconstruction. The palate has been removed completely and how do we uh, put in a zygoma implant. So this is a zygoma implant being shown to you. And uh, uh, you can see these are the, some cases which uh, we tackle. Most of the uh, abscesses were along the skull base. So our neurosurgeons uh, wanted us to do it through the nose. So we operated almost all, all the cases of the temporal lobe abscess as well as the frontal lobe abscesses through the nose. And of course, uh, the data of our own revisions are going to be published in the paper. Okay, so case scenario one, let's see uh, some cases. Uh, my interest is more clinical, so I want to show you more clinical cases, uh, how we tackle these cases. Let us see this case. You can see that this is uh, the maxilla being involved and also the palate being involved there. You can see that very, 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 very clearly. And of course, uh, let us now see uh, that that's the maxilla being involved, the ethmoids, and also so the maxilla ethmoid disease and how do we deal with this? Okay, let's go on to the video. You can see here that uh, the, the typical black middle turbinate, many people say there's a black middle turbinate that we didn't see, uh, but it sometimes sloughs out. Actually, it looks like this, it sloughs out. And then what we do is we have to resect that middle turbinate. However, you use it till the um, till we do the ethmoid for sake of landmark, and then you take it off. So I'm using a debrider now and uh, debriding away. And then what we do is we use a cobulator to define the anterior uh, wall of the pyriform aperture. And once you do that, so what you will do is. Uh, elevate to see if the pre-maxilla is involved. Of course, you can use a drill, you can use a mallet and a gouge to remove that. And once you do that, you can see here, once we open it, what do we see inside the maxilla? 
you can see all that mucor there. You can see that this is the mucor. I'm just trying to remove all that with a deep rider, send it for culture as well as for um, uh, for uh, for biopsy. And we found that even the bones contain the um, the fungus. So that's all that completely diseased palate, diseased bone. So I'm now going to uh, I'm debriding away the uh, you know the unhealthy mucosa, and then that is actually the ethmoid sinus. I'm trying to forward the video a little, uh, open up the sphenoid. Ethmoids was involved in very very less percentage, and the highest involvement was seen in the maxillary sinus, and uh, that was the you can see that I'm taking off the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus now. And once we do that, we actually check the pterygopalatine fossa and the infratemporal fossa. That's the, um, the posterior wall of maxilla. You can see the fat stranding. So this is something very, very peculiar to this disease. Of course, it's, you see it in uh, inflammation. And uh, this is uh, very, very typical of, uh, so I'm just clipping off the, um, uh, clipping off the IMAX and I'm delineating the pterygoid wedge there. So that's the pterygoid wedge being delineated with the cobulation and once you do that, uh, that is actually the uh, lateral pterygoid muscle attached to the lateral pterygoid plate and we will start drilling the palate. You see here, as we drill, this is very unhealthy bone. This is completely unhealthy bone of the palate. You can see that usually, even when you drill the clivus, it bleeds. Whereas here, it looks like sort of a, uh, it's a smelling or in the, it, gives a foul odor as well as it looks like a cheesy, curdy material, uh, which actually when you drill, there's no bleeding at all. This, these are all haversian canals, uh, which are affected by the fungus. You see that this is all sent for uh, biopsy and uh, culture as well. You see the pterygoid wedge, how much it's involved. So you can see that very clearly with your eyes that this is all mucor affected. And the idea is to completely remove all this dead bone till we have bleeding. That is till we have normal bone. So that is the aim. That is the end point of the surgery. You can see normal looking healthy bone which bleeds. So this is the V2 which has been affected again. And this is the VDN. And I'm now trying to create a lateral recess. You see how all these bones should bleed. Actually in a JNA, if you drill, it should bleed. Whereas uh, this is very typical of... Uh, uh, mucomycosis. This is actually the uh, post-operative uh, post-operative picture of that uh, patient. In fact, we have a very very nice documentation of this whole uh, process because it was done in a very short period of time, and uh, we had so many number of cases. So you can see here that you know MRI picks up the bone very well, the diseased bone, and both the greater being of sphenoids are diseased. The clivus is diseased in this case. And I'm going to show you the surgery to you. You can see how we start with a posterior septectomy. Of course, I have done a maxilla and an ethmoid um, um, surgery in this patient. I'm now taking off the uh, posterior septum. And once we remove the posterior septum, I will be exposing the uh, sphenoid sinus. That is the right side, the posterior septum. Now you see I'm using a four-handed technique. And this is see the bone now. So this is typical of mucor, very, very typical, no bleeding at all, just uh, uh, once you see bleeding, then you know it's novel bone. So this is, this is as simple as that. So clivus should bleed because it contains so much of, uh, you know, venous blood. Whereas when you do a mucor case, it doesn't bleed at all. It's actually very, very, very diseased. Uh, I'm now trying to drill all that clivus. See, see the kind of uh, bone you have, very unhealthy bone. And uh, we try to completely drill it till we, that's the cella. Now you can see the cella. This is the bone over the carotid canal. You can see that this is uh, the bone which I'm drilling over the carotid canal. And uh, in fact, we found cavernous sinus involvement in a lot of cases of uh, mucomycosis. You can see that this is all dead, diseased bone. It's all dead, diseased bone. And uh, now in this patient, he had bilateral graving of sphenoid involvement. I'm now trying to uh, delineate, that's a median nerve. See how the color of the median nerve, it was actually brownish in color. I'm now trying to drill off the, uh, the bone between the middle cranial fossa. This is the 
this is the V2 here. Just to orient you, that's the V2. See, that's the normal bone. You can see the cortical bone and this is disease bone. You can see that very clearly. Of course, we'll be coming out of the book. Uh, I'm coming out of the book on mucor mycosis very shortly, within a matter of three, four months. And in that, we'll have around 26 to 27 videos of uh, various kinds of, uh, you know, uh, presentations of mucor. So that will be a very useful book for uh, the juniors and postgraduates. And you can see here that uh, this is the greater wing of sphenoid, which is being drilled. And in fact, see that. See, this is normal. Uh, well, that's a dura. The, you can see the dura here, the middle cranial fossa. I'm going right posterior. You see here now, this is the cella, the clivus, and you can see that this is the um, the V2, the VDN, and uh, here is the paraclival carotid. That's the level of the quadrangular space. This we call as the quadrangular space. This is the VDN very clearly seen there. And now if there is a little bleeding, that means, see, that's actually the V3, the canal for the V3. That's actually the Meckel's cave. If you go inside, you'll find the Meckel's cave. So we did the same thing on the other side as well. So, so we basically have uh, cases where both the greater wing of sphenoids get involved completely and all the marrow spaces are filled with fungus. So that is what we found in mucomycosis. And you see here now, you see uh, the VDN, V2, VDN, V2, both sides and have gone far laterally. And this is how, and the clivus completely drilled till normal healthy uh, you know, bleeding can be seen. That's a V3 here. And that is kind of a picture we have after uh, we have done the surgery. And basically we are now going to publish this as uh, what is called the Holy Cross sign. You can see here, uh, almost several cases with beta wing osphenoid, both sides involved, have this kind of uh, post-operative MRIs. Both sides beta wing drilled and uh, um, goes to the level of the palate here. This is still the planum and you have something like a cross, holy cross. Now, well, how do we deal with the palate? Uh, we are slightly conservative um, with the palate in the sense, if the palatal mucosa, the mucoperiosteum is not affected, we try to preserve that and we uh, do a mid facial and then remove only the bone of the palate leaving behind the uh, the mucosa and the periosteum. So let us now see this case. Imagine this case coming to you. Uh, extensive disease involving the frontal bone, the parietal bone. We have also seen occipital bone involvement. Occipital bone, complete skull. We have removed the skull in such cases. Imagine that. That's a kind of, you know, devastation which uh, this, it produces. So let's now see this case. Uh, see that. This is completely involving the cavernous sinus. The carotid is narrowed. You have thrombosis of the carotid sometimes. So I just want to um, uh, show you that this is actually a case, a very, very, very advanced case where I'm now going to start my drilling from the maxillary sinus. This is actually a Denkers, modified endoscopic Denkers. That's one of the standard procedures we do for most of our cases of uh, mucomycosis. You see, the bone is so diseased. You can see that the, uh, you know, it looks like, uh, when you open, uh, you open the bone, there is pus coming out from the marrow spaces, pus coming out from the bone, which is actually very, very sad. Uh, of course, this is one disease where we found this kind of, you know, so we drill it till we have healthy bleeding. So this is, this is one surgery we want to see blood. Uh, uh, of course, in all other surgeries, we don't want to see blood. Whereas in mucor mycosis, we want to see blood because that is the end of the surgery. So you can see here that, see how unhealthy this tissue in the infratemporal fossa looks like. It's all unhealthy tissue. So here we are, I'm trying to now take off all that for biopsy. And once we do that, I use my correlation to get that plane between normal muscle. I'm now trying to correlate that with the scan. Of course, all this is going to come in the book. Not to worry, you will be seeing all these as videos in our textbook of mucomycosis, which is going to be published by the Thema Publications. Now, this is actually the greater wing of sphenoid. This is actually the going towards the temporal fossa. I'm going towards temporal fossa for, it's a little difficult to orient, that's the sphenoid sinus. This is the coena. 
this whole thing that that's the orbit above the whole thing is disease you see it's all osteomyelitic completely osteomyelitic fungal osteomyelitis and now i'm now that's the ethmoids you can see that ethmoids uh, even though the gadolinium osphenoid was involved the ethmoids were not diseased in many cases now this is the drilling now that is the planum of course i can make it out but uh, people who see it for the first time might not even uh, try to you know uh, get oriented because uh, i'm playing it in a, a very very rapid mode so um, you can see that's actually the level of the cribriform plate and uh, let us now see, see the kind of bone which comes out this is actually the uh, osteomyelitic bone of the gadolinium osphenoid which is being removed so all these bone pieces see this is the bone coming out uh, that is actually the uh, median nerve the cell is here see that it's actually shaking the whole central skull base is shaking oh my that you can see that this is actually coming out like yeah this is this is a kind of bone which comes out in mucor mycosis and we just remove that till we see normal bone not a great disease to have for sure that's the clivus which i'm drilling basically i honestly believe that you should be a good skull base surgeon if you want to deal with advanced mucor cases because uh, most of the times it involves the clivus the gadolinium osphenoid the meckel scape the cavernous sinus and the bone or the carotid artery so i am actually drilling over the paraclavicular carotid right now so you can see that this is actually being um, drilled and that's the clivus this is actually the uh, pharyngeal basal and the buccopharyngeal fascia and now we are going towards the orbit so you can see that this is actually the uh, bone which is completely diseased again that's the periorbita that's the periorbita and finally we're taking off that bone from the mesophyll that's the final view of the cavity you can see that's the uh, cella paraclavicular carotid that's the tuberculum planum optic nerve uh and this is the nasopharynx eustachian tube on both sides very very uh, sad to see such pictures but this is the maxilla the, the mucosa looks healthy on this side Th that's the only sinus which was left behind by the disease okay so here we are um i have now completed my uh, presentation and uh, i'm going to um start with my where's my second one the second part of this presentation one share share screen this one okay now let us go and uh, see this case can you can you see my uh, screen my dear uh, dr priya Dr. Puya, hello, hello. So you see this case, a case of a frontal lobe abscess. You can see here, and uh, very clearly see a ring enhancement. And how do we tackle this case? Now, basically, I'm going to forward it because. Uh, the basic steps remains the same the anterior craniofacial resection now i am opening up the dura you can see that i am opening up the dura of the frontal base and once we do that so basically the neurosurgeons would like the skull base surgeons to do it because uh, uh, it is it is in contiguity with the uh, the nasal disease so basically we are well trained in that's a gyrus rectus you can see that very clearly that's the um, the olfactory nerve tract and here we are we are opening up the uh, abscess very very nicely you can see the pus coming out pouring out of the brain and what we do now is actually open up so in fact in our paper we have uh, almost published 
uh, I'm not exactly sure about the numbers, but we have uh, a lot of cases of intracranial abscesses, especially in revision cases um, uh, on long, long standing cases. You can see that pus coming out. You can see that that is from the frontal lobe. So we irrigate with amphotericin, plain amphotericin, and then basically we'll have to remove the capsule of the uh, abscess. That is very important. Remove the capsule of the abscess. You can see that I'm removing the capsule of the abscess. Still, you have the normal pia, and then you irrigate well. And the closure is almost the same. There's nothing different. You're going to close it with a. This case, we used a pericranial flap. You can see that that's a pericranial flap being used. First is the facial ara, and then the pericranial flap with fibrin glue. Okay, so uh, we sometimes do a combined approach as well. It's not that we do endoscopic approach for all the cases. Here is a case where it was operated already. You can see the sinicae. I'm now trying to <coughs> do a modified endoscopic <coughs> denker surgery. So you can see here that uh, this is the cribriform plate. I'm doing a draft three. Uh, the first olfactory neuron is what you saw, and now that is the draft three being done. You can see here that's the RAT60 debrider blade. You are seeing the frontal sinus on both sides. That's the frontal T. You can see here that there is disease here. You can see here. It is far high up. You cannot approach this posterior wall through a draft. So we need a combined approach. So we used an external incision, and then we drilled the... Uh, the floor and once we do that you can see that this is the disease which is extending along the uh, posterior wall going laterally and you can see here that I started drilling this using a combined approach that's the orbit orbit below see that this is osteomyotic bone forming the supralateral wall of the orbit this is actually a a very tricky, if you leave it behind, the patient is not going to be all right. He's going to come back with an abscess in the frontal lobe. So here we are, we are trying to drill off the anterior skull base and also drill off all that osteomyotic bone above the orbit. And you see that how we are trying to get normal bone. So here is the orbit below. That's the skull base above. That's the frontal sinus mucosa. And you can see that this is the final result. We completely removed that bone, the draft three. So I'm just forwarding it actually, but uh, it'll all be seen in the book in a very, very nice fashion. So that's amphotericin being given. And this is the final result which you get. So we are following up this case. Uh, let us see this, uh, this case. You can see here, this is completely diseased here in the uh, frontal, the clivus, the greater wing of sphenoid. And uh, let us see uh, some more cases. Um, this is a case where we use the IGS. So we use the uh, endocyanin green. Uh, uh, and that is very useful to delineate uh, the vascularity of the bone as well as, as you know that uh, the Carl Stores has got the uh, uh, camera uh, where we can use the IGS system. And uh, now you can see that we're going to use that. You see here, this is the, the, the infratemporal fossa and the pterygopalatine fossa. And now once we inject endocyanin, it will completely turn. You can see that. Ah, see that now. So that is endocyanin being injected uh, intravenously. The dead bone doesn't take up endocyanin. So that's, that's the... Uh, very, very nice uh, way to delineate between dead, dead tissue, dead bone, and a normal bone. So here is the bone which is dead, and I'm going to remove that bone. And that is actually uh, just to show you the, um, the technology. Of course, uh, this is again another case where, uh, you know, that's the IMAX. There are several such cases where, you know, extensive skull base involvement. We've gone till hypoglossal canals. I mean, uh, there is no part in the skull base, central skull base, we have not gone to, at least in mucomycosis. This is something just below, the, this is an intrapetrous approach. This is an intrapetrous approach. 
So you can see the climbers, and then it goes like a flower was classical. When you do the uh, see, that's a carotid artery, foramen lazarum. This is the foramen lazarum. You can see the horizontal carotid here. Uh, the whole clivus from above and then going right till the level of the hypoglossal canal. In fact, all, all parts of the uh, ventral skull, that's the orbit, were approached by us during this uh, epidemic of mucormycosis. So this is actually the... Uh, and of course, the orbit as well. So that's the orbit. You can see the optic nerve. Sometimes we do what is called a limited orbital debridement uh, or we plan for orbital excentration. Basically, we try to uh, avoid a complete excentration. If it's uh, required, then we do it. So that is actually the uh, intraorbital uh, dissection, which we are doing in this case. So that is a superior orbital fissure being uh, uh, delineated. That's the optic nerve. You can see that uh, the patient was blind, complete ophthalmoplegia. That's the optic nerve. See the color of the optic nerve. It's actually dark brown. So. We sent that for biopsy as well. So that is the superior orbital fissure. So you see that that is the uh, globe which was uh, preserved. Now you can see bilateral, uh, so many such cases. Uh, I think I will, um, I think I will exceed my time if I keep on talking about this. I just want to thank Dr. Koya for this wonderful opportunity. And I'm sure that our uh, book, which is going to be released is going to help all the people around the globe to uh, 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 diagnose and treat. Thank you very much. Well, can you hear me? Yeah, very much, my dear brother. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the presentation, Jay. I think that some of the of the cases is that. of course of uh, the combination of a previous surgeon then don't have the knowledge and, and that they don't have the, the knowledge or the skills to produce uh, and to avoid uh, recurrence and and I think that the way that uh, the, the next few months are going to establish a fundamental or the roots uh, of such procedures will help a lot in such scenarios. Uh, one, one important thing to, to remind to the, to the attendees is that pathology Can you hear me now? Your, your net, I How think there's a problem with the net. In the yeah. Back. Yeah, I think that it is a problem with this. So um, there's a lot of connection going out. So I think that instead of all the, the questions and all the reminders, uh, uh, I would love if you can attend and do a perform a live surgery. Yes, so sure. if we can set up this, instead of in questions, we will go and plan a live surgery for mucormycosis. Sure, sure, sure. I'm sure I can do that because we have a lot of cases of mucor lined up in our ward even now. There's a lot so of one thing that. I think that. If you, if you agree with me, we will plan and we will communicate as soon as possible a surgical procedure for COVID-19 uh, mucormycosis related, if it's okay for you. Sure, sure, sure. I'm ready. I'm ready. We can Perfect. do it. So thanks, everyone. What did you say? We, we can combine and do a lot of live cases. We have a lot of live cases. We can do that. No problem. Perfect. So we will make the announcement very, very soon. Thanks, everyone, for watching and for participating.